You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today's episode takes on the subject of post-processing in landscape photography and asks the question, is there an ethics to landscape photography? We're very fortunate to be joined by two incredibly talented artists, Ryan Dyer and Anna Burton, and we'll be discussing the pleasures and challenges of their craft. We'll talk a bit about gear and their use of filters, but want to concentrate on the workflow and specifically on their post-process philosophies. The idea of this episode is to try to establish the line when post-processing turns photography into something else. Is it acceptable to represent nature without natural characteristics, and can you go too far? Finally, does an ethics similar to that in photojournalism apply to nature photography? Before we start, a request from all of us to all of you. If you enjoy listening to our show, take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. And if you're not already a subscriber, subscribe. It's free. We'd love to have you as part of our family. And trust me, I'll do the dishes after dinner. All right, let's start with Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week. And uh, the Pick of the Week this week is actually only a couple of hours old, the new Leica M10, which is the latest generation digital M camera from Leica. The new camera has a 24-megapixel full-frame CMOS sensor that they say was developed specifically for the new camera. ISO sensitivities go up to 50,000. There's two gigabytes of internal memory. Uh, Back of the camera has only three buttons, a joystick, play, live view, and menu. It's got built-in Wi-Fi for direct transmission of DNG files. You could also operate the camera remotely. And according to the specs, the new camera seems to be the slimmest out of all of the digital M cameras. And from what we understand, it has about the same form factor as the film version of the M6 and M7, which is really nice because the original digital M cameras were considered kind of chunky compared to their film counterparts. Operators are standing by. Well, our first guest today is Adam Burton, and he is one of the UK's leading landscape photographers and the author of six books. Since 2008, he has been working as a full-time landscape photographer. Pretty cool. Regularly supplying imagery and undertaking commissions for a wide range of clients, including British Petroleum, The Times, and National Geographic. His most recent book is Photographing Cornwall and Devon. You've been taking pictures since 2001, and starting, in, according to your bio, 2008, you've been specializing in landscape and nature. Did you, were you drawn to that early on, or is that something you sort of stumbled upon after photographing other things? No, no, that's, that, that's actually the only thing I've ever done. I've on, only ever been shooting landscapes. Um, is it safe to that, assume that you used to, you were pretty much in awe of landscapes and nature before you even picked up a camera? I yeah I I think so I've always had an appreciation for the outdoors and that was the reason I got into taking pictures but then since I picked up a camera uh, it's opened my eyes even more to 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 the outdoors so so yeah my appreciation of the outdoors has grown since since I've become a photographer now you started off in film which I think is is I think it's good for anybody to play around with film, whether you started off in, or not. Um, how how have you how has your approach changed since you've switched over to digital? Do, are you are you capturing things to the same fidelity? Because I know that you you seem to stress the neutrality of color and not and not try to interfere or enhance too much or keep things within reason. Um, are you getting a little bit more frisky with digital? Um, I don't think so. No, I, I, I don't think I am. I, I've, so from starting off in film, um, as you, as you say, I, I've always, I've always had this strong belief in, in doing things in ca- capturing, uh, nature at its most authentic and, and nothing more really. So, um, even though, even though the process is different digitally, I'm, I, I still have, I have that sound belief of doing things what I would say properly. Um, so no, I don't, don't, I don't think I'm pushing things any, any more than, than, than the film I used to capture would, would, would capture uh, images. Knowing that your motivation comes from the desire to, you know, reproduce nature as true to life as possible. Can you then 
walk us through your your gear selection? Did that always did that make a difference? Did you test different cameras, different sensors, you know, with that in mind? And then can you walk us through kind of step by step your gear, your software, and and how you approach your work? I, I yeah, sure. I I think it's worth saying at this point, guys. I'm I'm really not a photographer that's that's into gear um and i i'm not a technical photographer when i first got into this i i I picked up a camera and that worked for me it was a pentax years ago film camera then then i moved to nikon with film then i moved to canon with digital then i moved back to nikon so and 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 the only reason that i'd made those those uh decisions was a new camera came out that, that had more megapixels or um, a new film camera came out that looked better than another one <laughs> to me. There was no, there, there, I wasn't doing any testing. I, I wasn't really reading many reviews. I've, I've never been that kind of person. And it's always um, been 35 millimeter? Um, w- yes. Yeah, frame, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, those things aren't really that important. Uh, and you, you see on the internet loads of photographer like geeks, as, as you called them, um, reviewing different lenses and different this and that and the others. And, and certainly for your business, that's 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 brilliant. But for me, it's the most important thing is having a camera and getting out there, getting outside, whatever the camera is, just getting outside and shooting with it. So, so I'm not really um, technical technical at all i just know as much as i need to know and everything else i just push that away to one side i don't really want to know that Mm -hmm. um so coming back to your initial question my process of of taking a photograph i want to get it right in camera as much as possible i want to get everything right in camera um and so for that reason uh, for me neutral density graduated filters are are everything i i use lee nd grads um for virtually all of my pictures, and, are, and are I they, know are they, in, they're all neutral. Do you use any of the color grads? Ever? God no, never. Okay, never, I never. was trying to trip you up. You say you don't. Okay, good. Okay, you're being Absolutely consistent. Absolutely not. Keep going. I mean, I, I, when when occasionally you don't see them often now, but occasionally on on workshops when I'm leading workshops, people turn up with sunset grads and tobacco grads and <laughs> yeah. all sorts of horrendous filters and like no you don't want to use them we want to capture what's there and an, an nd grad will help you capture what's there we don't want to create something that wasn't there because that's not well for me that's not right so so nd grads are great and and if you t- if, if you get up and the sunrise isn't colorful well the sunrise isn't colorful if you if you if you want a colorful sunrise go home and then come out the next day and the next day and the next day <laughs> until you get it right. Don't go and create something on the computer because that's, that's for me. And I keep saying for me, because I don't want to upset people that, that, that are happy to do that. But for me, that's not what landscape photography is about. And so I use ND grads. I, I try to get everything right in camera. I'm uh, <laughs> to the point that I, I loosely follow the exposed to the right rule, I, but I don't, I don't really push it. Um, I'm sure you know all about exposed to the right and pushing your histogram as mm-hmm, far as mm-hmm. possible. Um, but I don't want to do that because that can make your picture look very wrong in camera. And then obviously you bring the processing to, to bring it back. But I, I, I don't want to do that because for me, the, the bus in photography comes from um, taking a picture and having it pop up on the screen and going, whoa, look at that. That's great. I'm so happy I got it right. And so I've, I've always used grads, and, and, and I see lots of great pictures that people capture um, who blend exposures and do things differently. Um, but I know that if I was out in the field and I, I, took, I, I, I witnessed something that was really lovely, some amazing scenery, na- nature at its best, and then I, look, I, I looked at my screen, my LCD, and there was one picture of the sky that looked lovely. And then there was another picture of the foreground that looked lovely. I wouldn't really get much of a buzz from that. I want, it, I want to see a picture pop up on the back of the screen and go, yeah, that's great. So um, I shoot in RAW. So I, I, I need to process the images in, in Lightroom, as everybody does. Um, but that's only minimal processing, just the basics. Um, and then uh, after what, that, what, what are the basics to you? Um, well, I, I, I go, I go down the settings on the right. This is, this is where I'm going to, again, sound like a complete idiot. Because I can't <laughs> even remember the settings, but yeah, I, I would, I would be, um, adding a, a little bit of vibrance to a picture. I've, I've always liked saturated pictures, but only to the point of what I feel is, is natural. Mm-hmm. I mean, I should, I should probably hold my hands up and say, 
coming from the film days, I did shoot with v- Fuji Velvia, which, <laughs> as, as, as you guys know, is a saturated film. Yeah. So I've always been... Uh, I, I always uh, called Velvia an artist's rendition of film. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that, that's the way I started. And again, I, I started using Velvia because that's what people look at in magazines. That's what all the mm-hmm. photographers were, sure. were mm-hmm. using. Um, and so I, I, I put a little bit of vibrance onto a picture, not much, you know, probably between five and 15. And I wouldn't really want to go any more than that. Um, and I think that shows through my pictures because my pictures, I, I, I like a colorful picture, but I, I want the color to come from what's there rather than just bumping up in post-processing too much. Um, I will, uh, rescue shadows a little bit, um, and highlights, um, I, I, I'll apply digital grads. That's a new thing that I've learned. I do help my, I always use a neutral density grad, but then I will quite often now use a digital grad just to fine tune the sky, just to, just to subtly bring it down a little bit more if necessary. So, so I, I do do that. Um, Essentially, you're but, burning and dodging. If we were to talk about in, in the analog world, yeah, really what yeah. you're doing, and you're tweet, and you're doing the same thing with the saturation environment. You're just bumping it a little bit and guiding the eye, more or less. Yeah, just just basically, basically given the given the raw a little bit of life, which you need to do. Um, other than that. I don't really do anything. I, I, I never, I, I, I never go down and adjust the S curve doodah because I've never understood that. Um, <laughs> so I just do the basics. I adjust the white balance if, if, again, if I need to, I shoot daylight white balance. So everything's on daylight, but if I need to adjust the white balance, which I, I find with Nikon, you have to do more than, sorry, Nikon, uh, for you guys, <laughs> um, <laughs> more than, more than Canon. I, I, I find that the, the white balance needs to, needs to be tweaked a little bit. Um, and then I do go into Photoshop. Um, and, but I only go into Photoshop because I'm again, really rubbish with technology and I, I like to clean my image. So clone out dust spots and, and whatnot. Um, using Photoshop rather than Lightroom. I just find that it, it, it's something I'm more familiar with. I, I find it an easier, um, easier software to do that with. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's all I use Photoshop for. I, I don't do anything else with it these days. Mm. Um, so yeah, I don't do a lot of, of post-processing at all. And, and I want to keep it down to a minimum because I, I spend half my life sitting in front of the computer. Yeah. And I, I don't want to spend any more time um, doing weird and wonderful things. And I know there's lots of weird and wonderful things that <laughs> photographers do do with post-processing with layers and all sorts, but I, I don't want to do it. I just, I really don't want to do it. Can I jump back a little bit to, to talk a bit about grad filters and, um, yeah. Talk about when you bump into limitations and, and with grad, with grad filters and, uh, particularly versus blending exposures. How do you handle it? Sure. Okay. Well, well, um, for grads, firstly for me, and, and I guess this is for the listeners a little bit. Um, when I, when I first got into photography, I was dismayed with white skies with just everything had a white sky, even though the sky wasn't white. I mean, the sky's often white in the UK, but (laughs) but when the sky's not white, (laughs) um, when the sky's not white, why are my cameras coming up with white skies? And I just, I, it really used to bother me. And, and grad filters, they were something that I never wanted to use because they're clunky. You have to have a filter holder and mm-hmm. screw this on and then that on and then attach the filter. And it just, it just seemed to be something that before I'd used them, I, I, I didn't want to add that extra layer of complication in. Um, but they're amazing. They do such a brilliant job of holding back the brightest areas in the sky. So, so our, our eyes can, can obviously see, um, we can take in a, a extreme range of light from, from light to shadow, but the camera can't. So you're either going to expose for the foreground correctly, or you're going to expose for the sky. But when you get scenes of high contrast, the, um, the camera just can't handle both of those, um, together in a single exposure. So having a grad filter with half darkened glass and half clear enables you to tone down the brightest areas of the image, which are usually the sky. Um, I know around, you guys know all of that. How many stops do you go on that? What's, what's the most that you push it as far as uh, um, exposure compensation on top? I mean, the grads come in half stop, third stop, full, one and a half, two. How far do you push it before you think it's, it looks forced? 
Well, I've used um, so so I, I use leaf filters, and they 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 come one two three stops, um, and uh, that's all I own. Three filters uh, or three hard edge, uh, three strengths of filters. Um, I've used the three stop and the two stop together. Um, ah, but okay. Typic- but typically, I mostly probably most of the pictures I would ever take um, using grads would be with 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 a two stop a, a zero point six as as they're called with with Lee, um, because I don't and and this is this this comes down to the style of photography I do I tend not to look towards the light that much I like to work with the light rather than what I would call fighting against the light mm-hmm. shooting straight into a really bright scene straight in towards towards the sun um that's when you're going to need the strongest grad for and and I don't really do that often I want to look with the uh, take photos with the sun coming in from the left or coming in from the right um out of shot um, so you still need a grad, but not such a strong grad. So, so most, the vast majority of pictures that I would take would be with a, a, a 0.6 ND, Lee ND filter, which is two stops. Which also makes it easier to have water blur, which is another effect that you, you know, put, put to good use. Uh, fast question for you on that. We, we don't see blur. Our eyes actually <laughs> catch what we call still images, even though the water is rushing like crazy. So, but you don't consider that pushing out of you know uh, recording things the way we see it is because we don't really see things that way. But you accept that. <laughs> you you are absolutely right, and and you call me out there, and and I hold my hands up and say I I haven't got a good answer to that. If we I still love you, it's things, okay. It's a, it's if okay. If I want to capture things completely <laughs> authentically, then yeah, blurred water isn't authentic. I think I think for me, blur the blurred water came as as a, as a byproduct to to uh, shoot in landscape photography from the film days. Mm. So and it works the best by light, the way. It's more effective. It, Almost oh, yeah. always. I, I, yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, but but back in back in the early days when you're shooting with film and, and obviously as landscape photographers, we're shooting early morning and late evening when the lights at its best or or after the sun is set and it's twilight. And those at those times you are gonna have a longer exposure. So so the water naturally will blur. Um so it's it's part I, I know now with digital you can push the ISO up, but Again, that doesn't that doesn't give you the cleanest image, right, um, right? And and I quite I do like the effect, and I I know it's not totally natural. Well, it's not natural at all. Um, but then again, how can you catch your water natural? I mean, people have said this to me before. Well, when you have waterfalls, I don't like that veiled effect. Oh no, that's not right. You should capture it with a fast shutter speed. Well, that's not natural. Right. The only way to capture water naturally is if you video it, I guess. Um, Correct. And then you can yeah. see it yeah. see it flowing. So, so nothing's natural. Um, but I, I, in the past, I used to do lots of really long exposures over water. I don't tend to do that now. I like, I like about two, three, four seconds, something like that. And I think that softens the water, but you can still capture, um, some motion, some movement. So when waves are dragging back over along a beach, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so Lots of the pictures that on my website are obviously they're they're, they're pictures that uh, reflect my changes in my style over the years. Um, but these days, I like to I like to shoot around two seconds if I'm shooting water, ideally. Um, so lots of lots of lots of the new breed of landscape photographers. That makes me sound like a dinosaur, but but lots <laughs> of the, the new landscape photographers won't use grads, and they'll be really quite dismissive of grads when you see them writing on their blogs. Yeah, chuck your grads away. You don't want grads because of the limitations of grads. Um, and and I totally accept that uh, a blend a, a well blended shot is always going to look cleaner than a, a a shot taken with a grad um but the majority of pictures taken with a even with a grad the majority of pictures will still be look absolutely fine there are exceptions um so when you're shooting at the coast typically you're going to have um a headland some some of the cliffs coming in at the left or the right of your picture and and, and obviously if you're pulling a grad down at, to the horizon then you're going to also darken that headland a little bit so so um that that can be a problem it's more of a problem to the photographer to the landscape guys who are shooting towards sunrise and sunset because obviously then you need to use a stronger grad 
and therefore any cliffs sticking up will really be darkened. Because I don't tend to do that as much as as maybe some of those people, um, I don't find that too much of a limitation. But but it is it is something to bear in mind. So again, if you're shooting uh, mountains, you've got a really uneven horizon with, with, with mountains sticking up, then you have to just be more careful about using grads. I use hard edge grads. Um, you can also get soft edge grads, which where the, the transition line is more gentle. So the theory is if you're shooting mountains or a picture with an uneven horizon, then you can use a soft edge grad and it won't be so obvious. It won't noticeably darken it's, the It the feathers off so more much. gradually. Yeah. Yes. Um, but the trouble with those soft grads, they're also not as strong. In order right. to have have the same effect, you need to pull them down so far that they almost cease to become a grad. So I've never really worked with them too much, and I, I tend to stick with with hard edge grads and just be really careful about how I line them up. Um, or that is when I'm shooting in the UK because we don't really have very big mountains, and you can t- typically tend to get away with that. Um, by the way, for people I, who are photographing in, in, in more uh, urban and suburban areas, you have the same problem if you're photographing if buildings are going up towards the sky as well. So yes, it's, yep. it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing. I've done a lot of architecture and grads I've, I've resorted to on many occasions. And you have to be a little bit creative sometimes because, yeah, it'll just jut right into it, just like a tree or a mountaintop. Same thing with a building. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and actually, I'm going to get on to talking about um, – a time when I don't use grads now. And uh-huh. so this is, this is bringing me right up to the 21st century, dragging, <laughs> kicking and screaming. Um, the last four or five years I've been running workshops in Yosemite and arriving in Yosemite, I'd, I'd been there before I'd run workshops and I, I knew what the landscape was like. And obviously you've got these huge, great, when you're in the Valley, you've got these huge, great Canyon walls. And when you're way down at the bottom, shooting towards them, shooting towards El Capitan or something like that. If you've got some strong light coming in, it's it's very difficult to use a grad because the mountains are sticking up so high yeah. that even with a soft grad, you're just not going to be able to do it. Um, so running workshops in places like that, I, I, I need to give my clients um, uh, an option so they can capture pictures. We can't say, hey, these mountains are too big. If you can't shoot with grads, <laughs> let's all go home for tea. Um, we have to come up with a solution. And so I, I do, in those situations where I can't use a grad because of the limitations, I will now, shock horror, you'll, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll be really surprised to hear this, I will take several shots to blend. Um, and that's something that in the past I would never have done. I would have walked away from that, the, that, that picture. But now I don't. And so in every situation that I can use a grad, I will. But in the situations where I can't use a grad, I will take a series of shots. And the, the thing that's, that, that, that finally um, changed my view on that was um, on doing that was Lightroom. When Lightroom introduced their, um, their um, blend to HDR mode, their HDR function, um, that's something that initially I thought, no way, I'm not using HDR. HDR is just, for me, it's, it's the devil. It's just hideous. <laughs> I don't want to use HDR. But, but Lightroom's HDR, it's not HDR as we know HDR. It's, it's uh, your pictures. Um, they, it, they, as long as you don't push it too far, they look fine. And so in the situations where I've got something like mountains that are sticking up so far, like in Yosemite as, as a perfect example, I, I will take a series of shots and then I, I, I'll blend them or HDR them. But I think I, I like to call it Lightroom blending because it, it doesn't, HDR just has bad connotations, mm-hmm. I think. And, and, and that helps me. But I'll only do that when I absolutely have to. Don't you feel better now that you've come clean? <laughs> 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 I'd say give it a year or so and I'll be HDR and everything to death. <laughs> Saturation no, plus 100. <laughs> no, by the way, you know, I, I, I think your attitude is extremely healthy. I mean, you, you look, look, you have a picture in your mind's eye. You're out there, you're seeing, the, you, you're watching the scene and you have a picture in your head and you want to get it and you're using the tools that are available to you to achieve that effect. And, and that's perfectly fine. So, yeah, I think that's, real, that, that's the way it should be as opposed to 
there, there are other people who will basically max out all these effects that they have at their fingertips in every single shot. And this stuff looks like, you know, Peter Max posters from the 1960s. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you know, by the way, a fast question. I'm, I'm looking at your work as we're speaking. I'm, I'm on your website and you do have a very, very uh, a soft kind of a palette. And your work obviously doesn't go to extremes in any way. There's nothing where anything is amped up. Every once in a while, and it doesn't matter where you live, we luck out a few times a year where you have a sunrise or a sunset where the, the sky is perfectly clear and the sun goes right down to the horizon and you look around and it's like a Maxwell Parish painting. Everything is just exaggerated to death in gold rays, much more so than your pictures. If you were there, would you take a picture under those lighting circumstances or would you say to yourself, nah, nobody will believe me? Um, no, I, I would take a picture. A- okay. Absolutely. For me, um, if nature's thrown that up, even if some people were not going to believe that that, that, that was um, that, that I captured that authentically, um, if that's what nature threw up, no matter how unbelievable, I'm going to capture it. My 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 goal in life is to capture what's out there, what what nature gives you, um, and no more. Um, but at the same time, no less. So if nature gives me something that's really unusual um, and doesn't look like my the, the end result won't look like my normal pictures, well, I'm still going to shoot it because it's still nature, it's still natural, and 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 that for me is it's always the most important thing. You want to capture what's there, and like I said at, at the start of this call, if you if you go out and you don't get the sunset. You don't go and create it on the computer. That, that to me, is totally wrong. And, and it really, f- for those of us that, that go out and try and capture what's there, it's like a kick in the teeth that other people go out and just create things. They just, they just make up the light because then it, it takes away um, when you do find something that's really, really special. It, it seems to like really take away from that. Um, so yeah, if it's, if, if some, if, if something happens that's unusual and really looks a bit otherworldly, I don't care because it's nature and I'll capture it. If, but if I, I the asked that way, by the way, almost like half in jest. I mean, I know you mm, jump on it. Well, I do, I do <laughs> think that when I'm processing it sometimes, but I don't, I, I, I still Not if it's there. It. Yeah. Yeah. And can I ask a bit about your, your process in the sense of, uh, when you go out for a, for a shoot, do you walk the same fields and the same coastlines regularly? Do you just go for a hike and find what, what you, what you want to shoot? Or do you do you earmark something and come back another day and try to work it through different lighting situations? How's that? How do you tend to work? Well, I, I really should say that I, I, I go to a location and, and I plan it and then I go to a location and then I come back and back and back and back again until everything's perfect. But I, I'm, I'm not that patient, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I, the locations that are close to me, yes, I know them very well and I will go to locations regularly and, and, and obviously make the most of the light and, and capture great, great moments because I'm going there more regularly. Um, but at the same time, I, I have, for me, the process of, of photography is, is a real, it's a real emotional thing for me. And if I go to a location and the conditions are really not, not great, I can have a, a, a real, quite a bad emotional connection with mm. that location at that time. And so I won't want to come back to it because <laughs> oh, I have, a, in my mind, that location's not good because it's always <laughs> foggy or rubbish. Um, so I don't want to come back to it. So, so if a location, if, if everything comes together, then brilliant. I love it. And if something doesn't come together, I have to sometimes force myself to go back to a, a particular place. Um, but yeah, I work locations a lot if they're local locations. I think I'm also quite good in finding the potential of locations that I visited for the first time. I'm very quick at working and I can... Uh, when I when I go to different locations around the world or different locations around the UK that I haven't been to before, I can very quickly take photos without having any idea of that that environment. I can just immerse myself and find a shot and, and shoot. My wife has always called me slapdash photographer. She always <laughs> says because the, the the you're always told as a photographer to um to get to a location, 
don't just get your camera out. Walk around, try and find the potential. You might find see a view that you like, but there'll be a better one if you spend some time just researching the location. Mm-hmm. I will get to a location and I'll be walking along with her, and then all of a sudden I'll just plonk my tripod down and take a picture. And she's like, "You're just taking a shot in the first place you see." But but I'm I'm everywhere we walk, I'm always thinking about the picture subconsciously. And so the moment that I get my tripod out to take a picture, I know that that's the picture that I really want to take. It's not just a case of accepting the first place I've seen that, that is the, it's a, it's a location that I've really worked in my head subconsciously. And then I find the shot and go for it. And you also Um, know that it may not be there when you come back later. Because the light it, yeah. changes and everything else. And it might change for the better, but then again, it might change for the worse. In the meantime, oh, you've got it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there you uh, go. Absolutely. And that is something that I, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because that, that's something that really, really bothers me. The thought of missing things. Um, mm-hmm. and, and as you say, conditions can be better another time, but they're never going to be the conditions they were. Not exactly. They're always going to be subtly different. Variations um, and if on I, the theme. Yeah, and if I've missed something, I've missed that moment. It's gone forever, and that eats me inside. So, so yeah, it's for me when I when I get to a location and if it's something I want to shoot, I'm there. I get my gear comes out straight away, and I can set up in seconds, and I'm shooting it because the thought of missing that is a, is just a really bad thing for me. I, I don't I don't ever want to miss a miss a, an opportunity. I mean, no photographer does, but I think it really bothers me because. Lots of people say you'll you'll get you'll get a sunrise again like that. <laughs> you'll get a better one, but you won't get that one. That one's gone forever. Um, <laughs> so right. yeah. Um, having an, said an all of that, obsessive photographer. I, think, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> ha, ha, having said all of that, I don't. I, I wouldn't want um, any listeners to think that I just rock up at, at locations and take f- photographs without doing any preparation. Because any landscape photographer worth their salt knows that. The time spent at home researching locations where the sun's going to rise, what the weather's going to be like, how to get there, where to park, how far to walk, um, all of those th- those preparation things, they're so important um, to get a good shot. And I think it's something that a lot of people getting into f- landscape photography for the first time don't quite appreciate how much goes into that. Um, and certainly people, when you lead people to locations on, on workshops, um, they... I don't think they generally appreciate how much uh, planning is involved in getting a good shot. And at the same time, always keep yourself open to whatever might be showing up that you didn't expect to see along the way. And yes. Be, and be yes. prepared to get it. Exactly. And, and that's something that, that I always say to people as well. I always say, because you, you hear a lot of people talking about like really stressing the importance of planning, pre-visualizing, planning, like waiting for a shot. And, and if you don't get that shot coming back the next day and the day after to get the same shot. But at the same time, I always say to people, just look over your shoulder and be good, be flexible. It's great to, to, to have an idea in your mind of what you want to shoot, but you need to be a, able to be adaptable and flexible mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. we know how fickle light can be. It can happen all over you, all over the place. You know, what the light that you're expecting in front of you doesn't happen, but there's some beautiful light behind. And so I, I'm quite good at that. I will very good at that. I think I can, I can adapt to the situation and, and go and find a different location really very quickly. And I think it's a really important skill for people to work on because it, it gives you a, a a much more broad portfolio as well okay. but, but but it's it's, it's quite hard because if i'm at a, a place and i haven't got the camera if i'm out walking with my wife and kids then well you know what it's like all photographers are exactly <laughs> the same you, you, you just you just feel totally sick that you're gonna miss an opportunity <laughs> well, kids, you stay here i'll be right back <laughs> promise i'll come back i promise <laughs> and, and here's a few and dollars if, if i don't you, yeah <laughs> If you have got your camera, then you're not really dedicating the time you need to be to your wife and kids. Mm, so th- those things, yeah, they, 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 they don't work very well together, but yeah. Do you think that there is an ethics of nature photography? And, and I'm going to kind of refer to photojournalism where a manipulated image, or even if something is cut out of an image, like the tree wasn't, the branch wasn't in the spot you wanted, so you removed it. Do you think that that falls into the into the realm of ethics where it's acceptable or it's unacceptable or do you just kind of feel it's up to the the photographer and, and let it go well i think 
I, I, I tend to say, you know, it's down to the person. And, you know, for me, I, I think it's wrong, but for another person, you know, each it's, it, it's up to them. But I, if I, if I wasn't going to sit on the fence like that, I would, I would love there to be a real ethics in, in landscape photography for, for, for it to be wrong to manipulate pictures in that way. Cause I, I, I do feel that. And I, I, I feel that, as I've said all along, capture what's there. Don't capture what's not there, and don't try to make something out of something that that wasn't there. Um, so, on, yeah. On, on that note, let me actually mm. qual- just throw a little qualifier, just out of curiosity. So, if you take a photograph and there's, a, say, an, a, an errant branch that you'd like to get rid of, you won't do that electronically or or post capture. What about before you take the picture? Would you move something out of the way or clip a branch if it was going to? if it was going to be a visually disturbing element to you, or at the very least, tie it back like that. It's no, no animals get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No problem with that at all. No, I, I've no, I mean, I, I, I won't say that I, I will hold my hands up and say, I do, I will clone things out. If there's a leaf or something like that in the way that bothers the picture and it's only really, really small, then I may clone that out. I'm not going to take out a whole branch or something like that. That, that feels wrong. But if it's, if it's like a, a, a leaf or a couple of little leaves on a otherwise completely reflective uh, piece of water, then if it's, if it's something very small, then I may get rid of it. Um, but Fair. Okay. if I can, if I can take that shot out of the scene when I'm there, then yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, I quite often will pull a little uh, like sapling branch back, hold it back while I'm taking a picture. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. once the picture's gone, then let it go back in. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. As long as you're not damaging, uh, what's there. Um, yeah, that, that's fine. I mean, sometimes when I've moved a rock into the foreground, because I need a rock in the foreground, it just feels totally wrong, only because it's in my, <laughs> my mind's eye, mm-hmm. I know that it's placed and it looks so obvious. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, it, I've done that in the past, but I don't tend to do it much. Um, but but move, moving, a, moving leaves, plants is no different than moving, say, a candy wrapper that was there. You know, you don't want that there. And I always say to people, don't just shoot it and then clone it out. Just go and pick the damn thing up. Because <laughs> you might... Sorry, I shouldn't say that. I don't, you Americans it's don't good. like that word, do you? No, we'll, okay. thing we'll, up. Okay that word. <laughs> we'll survive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I'd just like to finish up with... Uh, Asking you what you're working on right now? Um, what- I've just finished working on, um, well, I say just finished. Um, all of last year, I was working on a, a book project, um, which was a, a photographic guide, a guide to shooting the, the southwest of, of England and the coastline of the southwest of England, which is absolutely spectacular. Um, a bit like your uh, your Big Sur coastline in California, that, that kind of thing, really mm-hmm. rugged. Um, so I've, I... I worked on a a, a photographic guide, a a big book, like uh, nearly 300 pages, um, which was published in the summer. Um, and since that's finished, um, I, I don't have any similar projects next year like that. So next year is going to be, I think I'm booked up quite a lot with lots of workshops next year. So UK workshops, lots of international workshops and, uh, and also one-to-one, uh, tuition as well. So I'm going to be doing lots of tuition. Um, I'm working on a new website, which is uh, going to be coming out in the new year. And other than that, we'll, we'll just see what, what, what comes up. The good thing about being a photographer, you just you never know what opportunities you're going to get. Um, so it's quite an exciting job to have. Okay, so it's still adamburtonphotography.com for people That's who want me. to see more work and find out where your workshops are and uh, all the other goodies you got on your site. Yes, it's a nice site, yes. by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Adam Burton, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Terrific talking with you. Oh, no, that's great. Great talking to you guys. Thank you very much. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. Ryan Dyer is a Pacific Northwest-based photographer whose self-deprecation is as well-known as his incredible imagery. His bio states simply, I point my camera at stuff. Love it. But quoting the Visual Wilderness blog, his work is nothing short of inspirational. Ryan leads workshops year-round, has been published in a range of publications. Check out his Instagram feed for a taste of his work at Ryan Dyer. That's R-Y-A-N-D-Y-A-R. Ryan, thanks for joining us today. 
Uh, let's start off with a, a question. What drew you to landscape and nature photography? Were you a photographer? Were you into photography before you discovered landscape and nature, or did they go hand in hand, or did one lead to the other? What's the story? I got into photography in high school. Well, I got into photography class in high school, and I skipped class every day because I just <laughs> I just didn't understand it. Um, I passed the class by cheating, and that started my <laughs> photography career. Um, my buddies still... That's my day. playbook. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I get crap from my buddies still to this day about it. Um, I didn't really get into it, into it, like, you know, as a, as a hobby until my early 20s. Um, I just kind of picked it up on a whim, you know, got a camera as a gift, and brought it with me on on travels and things like were that you already into like landscapes and were your were your eyes already working uh, maybe that's where you're putting it were you looking and seeing pictures even though you didn't have a camera uh yes but more i, I was i appreciated oil painters more ah okay I, I tried to oil paint when i was when i was young when i was probably 15 years old and i wasn't good at it it's easy to take pictures for sure yeah i wasn't good <laughs> at oil painting in the first week so i gave it up uh, but but yeah, I've always appreciated landscapes and been into nature itself. Um, and the camera just kind of came second. Were you a, did you shoot film or did you go directly into digital? Straight to digital. Yeah. Ah, okay. All yeah. right. I, I, I don't, I've, I've tried to pick up film since and it's too much of a challenge for me. I, I, I learned the easy way. So going back and doing it the hard way is just, <laughs> determination for so did, did you are you a, a hiker and an outdoors guy did you always enjoy getting out in the woods and and, and that kind of stuff or is that not it was, so much it was more snowboarding a little bit of backpacking mm -hmm. but backpacking for snowboarding and so i brought the camera along on snowboarding trips okay um right. things like that and and you know i was always into travel and seeing new places and living out of the back of my car you know in, in the desert for you know a couple of weeks Okay. And so bringing the camera with me was, you know, a, just a way to document trips. I see. And it wasn't until I really found like online communities um, where, where people share their photos that I was like, oh, hey, this is actually a thing. Oh, that's great. Actually, that's something we were talking about earlier and, and the whole, the growth of landscape photography through these exact communities that you're talking about. Where'd you go? Where were you first posting your stuff? The first place, it was like 10 years ago mm -hmm. when Flickr. Flicker. was really big, like 10 years ago. Right. Uh, you know, I, I kind of just made a little, you know, page for, for my travel photography. I wouldn't even call it photography, just snapshots. Sure. And then you start seeing what other people are doing and you're like, Oh, Hey, this is actually like, there's cool things you can do with your photos after you take them. And so that just starts the snowball effect for at me. What, at what point did you start doing all the cool stuff to your photographs? Because anybody, if you, if, to look at your work, it's obvious that you, you're playing a lot in post. Um, yeah. Was this something that started pretty early on when you started taking pictures that you say, hey, I want to goose this a little bit more than normal? Yeah, I'd say it was probably within the first year, so about 10 years ago. And yeah, I, I stumbled across somebody who was using Photomatix HDR, and I was like, oh, that's cool. And so I tried it, and that was like the cool thing for me for a few months before I was like, wow, this is really, really going over the top. <laughs> I was going to ask you, at what point did you start throttling back, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and not that I it should be, you know, the, the deciding factor on what's over the top or not. You know, I mean, people will have their opinions on that based on looking at my work. But um, it, it was just such, I don't know. It was a very kind of fad sort of thing that, that popped up for, for a few years back then. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think I got into it right as that kind of look was on its way out. Um, but it, it kind of opened the door as to, you know, there's a whole realm of, of possibilities beyond just the shutter button. Just the caption. And, uh, you know, get, getting your images back on the computer and, and having fun with them you know, at home as well. So once I kind of got burnt out on the, on the HDR stuff, that's when I really started trying to find my own way of, of doing things manually and not just running it through some HDR program. Do you, do you describe yourself, would you, do you consider yourself a photographer 
or an artist or somewhere in between? What do you what do you label yourself as? I would probably call it somewhere in between. I mean, a, a photographer in the truest sense is probably not me. Um, Why would you say that? Because I, I don't know. I look at like true photography as as an image that documents a scene. You know, I mean, a, a camera in and of itself doesn't lie all that often. Um, what I do, you know, kind of blending, like I do a lot of weird stuff with blending different focal lengths and, 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 uh, you know, kind of creating some atmosphere and light that isn't necessarily accurate to, to that scene. Um, you know, it, it gets a little bit away from, you know, what like true photography in the sense of documentation, it really is. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not a photographer, you know, I can, I could shoot well, at least I, I like to think I can. I mean, th- I've got several friends who would argue differently, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, I do use a camera to take photographs. I am a photographer, but the post stuff gets it away from it being just a strict photograph. Aside from the uh, color on steroids, let me ask you something. This is I'm listening to you talk about how you're not considering yourself a quote-unquote purist, for lack of a better word, okay? Yeah. Let, let's say that Ansel Adams is a purist. I think a lot of people would say he is like the epitome of, of a traditional landscape photographer. Now, yeah. the truth of the matter is, he didn't just make a contact print of, of a large negative. There's a lot of yeah. retouching, burning, dodging, a lot of, well, you know, post-capture work that's done very, in a very subtle mode for the most part, yeah. but it is a manipulated photograph. That yes. said, are you a photographer? That said, Ansel Adams would use one image. Exactly. Uh, th- th- as, as far as that. Yeah. Okay. As, whereas yeah. I, I'll combine, you know, the, the, I just posted a shot uh, a couple of days ago from my last trip to Hawaii to photograph the lava. There was these explosions of lava going off, you know, in the background. It had these nice lines of, of, you know, crusted over lava rock in the foreground, kind of catching some of the ambient light. Um, but to get that scene the way I wanted it, I had to shoot the background at like 50 millimeters and the foreground around 20 millimeters and piece those two things together at different focal lengths. So using a couple, images composited together i'm not i'm not talking about you know i shot the lava one day and then you know a a week later i shot a foreground somewhere else but you know piecing together a scene you know of a couple images gets away from that singular photograph and so while i consider myself a photographer i'm not I'm a photographic artist, I, I guess is what you'd say, which sounds really lame. How about <laughs> photo? How about photo illustrator? Does that work for yeah. you? Yeah, I okay. mean, which is all kind of a cop out, I guess. You know, the, it, 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 at some point you have to really define who you are. You sounds like um, you have, you're having a hard time putting uh, the the label artist on yourself. And yeah, and why don't you just <laughs> we can just say you're an artist that you know you start your process starts with a camera. Uh, yeah. And it, it could go other places. Let me ask though: Is there a difference in your mind between using the example you just gave us? Uh, let's say you had gone back two days later and and taken a shot that you then included as part of your final piece. Would that change uh, the process for you? Would that put a different definition on what you're doing, or it's just a a matter of time and days? Um, to me, that gets away from capturing a moment mm-hmm. in time which I still think is important for me. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going back, you know, two days, two weeks, two years later and getting a foreground and piecing it together. I have no issue at all with any, what anybody wants to do with their images. Yeah, no, we, we're, we're mm-hmm. all on that. We, we, but <laughs> yeah. for me yeah. to, to go back a couple days later would take away from that singular moment. Mm-hmm. which is important for me to capture. Okay. Now, what I do with that moment to enhance it is, you know, something different. But I, I still want it to be that moment. And for me, it's because it's attached to memories. You know, I go back and I look at my images and I have this memory of that moment, mm-hmm. which really connects me with my images. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't feel comfortable with myself losing that connection 
you know, by by taking a you know a single moment and dividing it up over several different shoots. It just it, that's not for me personally. Well, that's great. That, that's what we're we're trying to get at. What what is the meaning for you? And and that's a, that's a great answer. I I totally appreciate that. Is there something though when when you do bring your images back and and you're working on them? Can you talk about where, what is too much? Where do you feel you, where do you draw the line when it comes to a, let's just call it manipulating an image or has, um, or you haven't found that line yet? I've not found that line personally for myself. I, I've seen what, what other people have done. And I think, no, oh, that's beyond the line for me. Mm-hmm. Was in that what, what are some of those things, for example, a, a color, uh, a, a total, well, you tell me. Uh, color, I'm okay with, but mm-hmm. but you know, blatant, unrealistic looking composites mm-hmm. tend to be, you know, the the big thing that jumps out at me. Somebody's shooting, you know, towards the sun at sunrise, but they fake the sky into it. That's you know, right. the sun is is at their back, and things don't line up, and it just light doesn't match. Um, it, I guess those are just more like technical fails than, 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 than like moral issues. But, um, I, I, I try to keep the scene real, um, to my feeling, which, which is a weird kind of gray area, you know, because the scene can look completely unreal and over the top, but I like to bring in the feeling I I had while shooting it. You know, if it's super, if it, if I felt, like this is some otherworldly scene that I might take that image to a little otherworldly, you know, mm-hmm. look. So it may not uh, be realistic, but it's plausible. <laughs> plausible. That's, that's, absolutely. that's how the impressionists define their yeah. work. I mean, so yeah. you're not too far from there in that sense. Yeah, I mean. yeah absolutely. Uh-huh. Okay. Can you walk us through uh, your process, your, your, your workflow from, from capture through even, even in terms of, the idea of do you go back right after you're done with a with a shoot to get to work on on your photos, or do you put that off for a later day to get a different headspace? Or I, I guess the whole process starts in the field. And in the field, I'm thinking about the finished product, you mm-hmm. know, while I'm shooting it, and I think that makes for a stronger, more direct workflow from from you know absolute start to absolute finish. If you are in the field and you can envision what you want the shot to be when you're done then you can ensure that you're getting the proper pieces to piece it together later. You know, for example, that lava shot I was talking about, you know, as I was shooting it, I knew these explosions were further away than, than what I would like for them to be in the shot. And so I had this, this image pictured in my, in my mind of these nice lines in the foreground, which I needed to, to shoot at a fairly wide angle to, to get, you know, the the type of distortion I wanted on the lines. Mm -hmm. Uh, But shooting them that wide meant the background explosions would be tiny and insignificant, even though they're the size of like a three-story house. They just felt too small. So I shot those um, fairly zoomed in uh, with a 2470. Um, And so I envisioned what I wanted that to look like in post. And so knowing what I want that image to look like, I can make sure to just grab all the pieces. And for me, I, I always use the analogy. It's like a puzzle. Yeah. You know, I, I've got all, I, I've got this image that I want, but I've got to get the little pieces that I can put together later. The word that um, I had was construction. That's what was coming through my mind. You're basically, you're constructing a, a, a sculpture, a light sculpture for that, for that matter. That's a, yeah, that, I mean, that's a really good way of describing it that I'm going to steal and use. You're as welcome own. to do that. <laughs> Thank you. We might have um, to copyright that right after the show. Would you believe <laughs> <laughs> um, Keeping in mind what I want the shot to look like, I can ensure, well, not ensure, but I can try my, my hardest to get all those pieces to construct the final image later on. And a lot of the times that's, you know, some focal length blending or, you know, um, blending different focus points for added depth of field, um, exposure blending, things like that. Um, the, even, you know, blending low, um, low ISO, longer shutter speed shots with high ISO fast, 
uh, shutter speed shots. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, I'm, I'm shooting a seascape and all of a sudden I see some birds are about to fly by, you know, I'll crank the ISO up, drop the shutter speed, get those still birds, you know, as they're flying through my scene. Mm -hmm. And then I can even piece that together in my image later. What percentage of your final images that you have on your website are constructions as opposed to images that while you might have done a lot of post work in it are one photograph without having little pieces thrown in or cut in? I would say probably 25% are the constructed type of um, blends and, and focal blends. Uh, and how much time do you spend on it? Because there's a lot of work here. So on average, for one of the photographs that would say one of your knockouts let's, on let's your website. Let's talk about the one that we're looking at and we're talking yeah, about now, okay. the lava shot. Yeah. The lava shot took me seven hours. Okay. In, in, in post. Um, that's not an average shot for me though. Um, mm -hmm. on average I'll spend two to three hours. Okay. Um, sometimes if I'm feeling, you know, especially lazy, then, then I'll, you know, burn through something in, in half an hour, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but what most of the work in most of the time is, is dodging and burning. Mm -hmm. I do a ton of dodging and burning all over the image. Um, and I'll spend hours just doing that, you know, with the, I mean, we're talking zoomed into, you know, 500% really pixel peeping and going in there and fine tuning all these little textures and, and atmospheres with dodging and burning. What do you envision when you're, when you're doing this work, where the photo's ultimate location will be? Is it on your monitor and for everyone else's monitor? Uh, or are you thinking past that to prints? I had a discussion about this the other day with my friend Miles Morgan, mm -hmm. um, who actually did a, a presentation for you guys. Um, the increasingly nowadays, you have to consider how things are going to look, even on a cell phone or an iPad, which is cool because it makes things a little bit easier. But I, I don't use that as a way to get lazy in, in post. Yeah. You know, I, I still want things to hold up in print. You know, and, and it's not that I do a ton of printing. Um, you know, I, I do some and I'll print my favorite shots and I've got a couple hanging in my house, but, um, it, it would seem to me that if you're going through this much trouble at the end of the day, you want to have a real fat meaty file because yeah. you're not going to go through this just to have something that's going to look great on Instagram. That's the, too much the, the, work. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I want the best image I can get and I, I, I won't let the whole Instagramification of, of photography let me get lazy. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But that said, a lot of the times, like this lava shot I was working on, I, mean, I, I photographed it at three in the morning. I mean, it was dark out, but you've got white hot lava in your scene. I mean, the dynamic range is just insane. It put me like right on the limits of what my camera can do and what I can do. And so there's some, some flaws in it with noise and things like that that just I don't think would hold up to a large print. And every now and then I'll have those that, you know, I I like the scene enough to where I'll make the image and know that I'll never be able to print it large. But just to have it and and put it out there as, you know, a an example of, of practice and, and technique and, and things that are uh, you're able to accomplish, even if that accomplishment can't be printed large. I would imagine that uh, with camera technology the way it is at this point in time, it's a lot easier, a lot more feasible to put together the kind of images you're looking to do as it was, say, two, three, four years ago, because cameras have gotten just so much better. Uh, I mean, it's just the technology's jumping by, by leaps, not steps. Um, it, it's really fascinating to see, you know, what I can do, what others can do with cameras that just uh, you wouldn't even try to do a few years ago. Speaking of which, which uh, cameras are you using? Cameras and lenses? Uh, uh, right now I'm with a D800, a uh, 14, 24, 24, 70, 70, 200. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll, I'll rent something longer if I need something longer. But what I, I don't use a ton of really long lenses. Uh, but then when I go back to Namibia in a, in a few months, I'll, I'll rent something long. I'll probably rent a 400. But, uh, but the, I mean, even with the, the D800 being, you know, a few years old now, what it's able to do compared to what 
my old 5D Mark II I used five years ago was, was capable of is, I mean, it, it opens a whole new world of possibilities. Far more options, definitely. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask uh, about, uh, you had said that you'll shoot for what you envision as the final product, but while you're working on that in post, do you improvise? Do you try things and, and put them away? And, and, and do you, do you, does your final product often differ from what you thought it was going to be? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, you, I, I like to, you know, pre-visualize what I want the shot to be, but sometimes you're going through the paces and you're kind of nudging it towards that direction and something else will open up or you'll have some new idea mm -hmm. that completely changes the direction you're going to go. Yeah. And, and even a lot of the times I'll try to pre-visualize and I just can't figure out what I want the shot to be. And so then you just kind of, shotgun it with a bunch of stuff and see what sticks and see what direction kind of works. You know, I'll, I'll sometimes process an image five, six, 10 different times right. um, before I finally settle on a direction that I actually like. Um, it, it, that's not uncommon for me, but more often than not, I'm, I'm already knowing what I want the shot to be. Right. And then I just kind of follow that, that mental image until I get it to that point, which it, it, it'll always differ a little bit from what I first visualized. But uh, I think it's important to know where you want to go with an image. And do you ever, for, for, do you ever uh, let's just say, walk away from a shot? Let's say, for example, using again this, this image uh, of a lava, and you knew that you wanted... Uh, the sparks in the, in, in the distance to be more in the foreground or at least larger. L yeah. Let's say you, it was too far that you couldn't bring it with the equipment that you had. Will you walk away or, or that's not really in your nature? You're going to get, you're going to take the shots that you need and, and try to figure it out later. I'll absolutely walk away from a scene. Mm -hmm. I, I, I walk away from more scenes than I actually photograph. Um, hmm. there's, there's tons of things I see that I think, wow, this could be incredible. And I put a lens on it and I just can't figure it out. I just can't for the life of me come up with a, a way to take this scene that looks good to the eye and make it look good through a lens. Mm -hmm. Um, That's interesting. And, and even, even I'll walk away from things in post, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the shots, think I've got something, get it into Photoshop and say, yeah, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. I've, you know, I've, you know, really flubbed this one up, and, and so I'll just abandon it. Um, that's good it, editing it, skills. That's really what that is. Yeah, that's the that's that's <laughs> too, that's true. Yeah, it's and good stuff. It's confidence and, in your work, and it's it's an under it's understanding of the artistic process. So that's great. I, I think we're all our own worst critics. Uh -huh. At least I am. You know, I'm very critical of my stuff, and. And I'm lucky to be surrounded by great photographers. My wife's a photographer, you know, my best friends are photographers. And so I'm able to bounce images off of them and, and get their feedback. And oftentimes the, the things that I'm willing to abandon are the things that they really like. And so ain't that the truth. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the, my, my most favorite images are images that don't do well with other people when, when I show them. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's fairly normal because we have a connection with our images that other people don't, right. you know, nobody's going to understand my connection with, you know, my favorite shots because my favorite shots have memories and feelings attached to them. You know, and that kind of sounds a little lame and kind of art schoolish, but, but, you know, having that connection with the image, you know, or lack thereof can really determine how you feel about it and how much effort you put into a shot. If it's based on aesthetics, I, I buy into that. But I, something that I know that I've done in the past is I'll, I'll think a picture is just amazing simply because it came out because it was just incredibly difficult to do. Yeah. Uh, and it turns out, yeah, it came out, but it's not that good a photograph, you know? Yeah. Yeah, th absolutely. And that's the way I feel about this lava shot where – you know, it was so hard to put together, and I spent so much time. It was one of the hardest shots I've, I've ever put together. Um, it, and at the end of the day, I don't think it's a great shot, but I'm, I'm so happy that it came out the you, way I you were able to pull it off. And that's what—that's the important thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the sense of accomplishment is is big on that one, even though it's not my my best shot or or even my favorite. 
you know, I'm, I'm very attached to that shot. I mean, you spend seven hours intimate with a photograph and, and you're going to love it for a while. That's true. Is there, is there any one shot of yours that, uh, you would say gets the most attention or the most reaction? I know that's a hard question to answer maybe, but is there a couple that, uh, that all, people always come back to? Um, yeah, I have a shot called into the Valley, um, that I, um, shot in, uh, 2009 in Glacier National Park. And it, it mean, very pretty photograph, very, very kind of predictable, but it was at the time kind of a lesser photographed group of mountains. Um, and, and I found this waterfall tucked away and I went back five nights in a row. And, and this was back when I didn't shoot with anybody else. I always shot by myself and it was kind of an escape mechanism for me. And so I have these, this emotional attachment to that image from, because I went back night after night and sat, you know, freezing my, my, my bottom side off in this Creek trying to get low in this water and, and mountain goats would walk by, mm. um, it, it just, you know, the, the feelings I have after finally getting that shot, uh, make it one of my favorites. But for some reason that tends to be other people's favorite of mine as well. Huh, well, that's great when they come me, together. Yeah. But, yeah. Which makes me feel good because it, I, I love that shot like a baby. And so when other people can appreciate it and not call my baby ugly, then, <laughs> All, it all it babies good. are beautiful. We know that. <laughs> yeah, Except for the ones that look like Churchill or Eisenhower. But that's <laughs> <interesting. Sorry>. um, <laughs> I have a question for you. Uh, grad filters, uh, do you rely heavy on them? I Neutral density to. filters? Or what's your, what's your stance on those? I, I used to. And I definitely still think they have their place. Um, the, there, There's a time in my life when I owned every scene ray grad filter, reverse <laughs> grad, every 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 strength and density, um, it, which was just an insane amount of money. But I, I slowly stopped using them in favor of blending exposures just because I feel like I can be a little bit more exacting of the, of contr the control factor is better. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I can, I can say, okay, well, maybe I want this part of the sky dark, but not this over here. And I, I can control if I'm having, you know, the, you always get a grad line across a mountain or something like that. They always called them grad lines. You know, you get that dark band going across your mountain, even with a soft edge grad. Um, and so to, I'd always have to fix that in post a little bit and. So if I'm going to be fixing those things in post, I might as well be just doing the, the exposure blend in post. Mm -hmm. That said, um, there are times when I'm, I'm shooting a scene and I'm wishing I had my grad still in my bag. Uh, a lot of the times it's with, uh, with shooting the lava. I've been shooting the lava a lot lately. And you know things change so quick with the lava scenes you have this plume of, of steam coming up from the lava as it hits the ocean and it steams. You've got this massive just plume of, of, of drama coming up into the sky. Well, if you're trying to blend exposures, I mean, the time it takes between one exposure and the next, the, the scene changes, the plume moves it. I mean, it, it's just constantly. It's all kinetic action. Everything is happening. Nothing's standing still. Yeah, and, and so to blend exposures in those scenes, it, it's possible, but it's a little bit more difficult. I mean, it, it, to have a grad um, would make it just a one-shot kind of deal. Which so the, that's the times when I really miss them. But even then, that's pretty rare. So they're good to have when practical. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's not like they weigh a ton either. I mean, I, I think it's better to have the tools than to not have them, and so. Right. I, True. I'm digging my my grads out at some point before my next lava trip. Okay. Um, is there what about uh, taking things out of an image? Do you uh, have any problem with that? Like cutting out a a branch yeah. or I don't know, putting a rock yeah. in the an errant rock. Yeah, I mean, uh, I I will do that. You know, if there's some, you know little straw of grass that's coming, you know, straight across my, my frame and my foreground. 
that kind of blocks things up. I'll, I'll remove that. Um, there's some mountain off in the distance that I think looks weird and sticking out in a strange way. I won't move that. Uh, you know, I, I want it to be accurate to what it is, but also accurate to my interpretation. Let me, can I ask something I should have asked earlier? Do, can you kind of run through what you, the, the software you use? And if there's any, any plugins, anything particular that you want to throw out? Yeah, I, I, I still don't use Lightroom. Okay. Um, I'm an Adobe Camera Raw guy. Okay. Always, always have been, probably always will be until they, you know, mm-hmm. don't make it anymore. Um, so Adobe Camera Raw and Photoshop, the only plugins I use are the, the I use the Nick Color Effects. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, there's only like two things in there I, I actually use, uh, which is one is the tonal contrast, which kind of helps pull out some textures here and there. Mm-hmm. And the other is the um, uh, pro contrast, and there's a slider in there called, I think it's called dynamic contrast that I'll use. Uh, but it, again, I use those sparingly. Um, most of the stuff is, is done, you know, just right there in Photoshop. Okay. There is an action panel uh, made by photographer Tony Kuiper uh, uh, using his luminosity masks and things like that that, that I will use. It, I I actually couldn't process without luminosity masks. And those are just for anybody that, that's familiar. Luminosity masks, and I don't like to call them masks because essentially all they are selections. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I call them luminosity selections. And those just allow you to make selections based off of brightness values in, in an image. So say you wanted to adjust some of the lighter areas in your image, you could make a selection of just those lighter areas or the darks or, you know, you know, different thresholds of, of those things in between light and dark. What, uh, uh, what monitor do you use? And are you, uh, constantly calibrating it? Uh, the I, same don't thing. Calibrate, I don't calibrate nearly as often as I should, maybe mm-hmm. twice a year, but I'm using a 27 inch iMac. Okay. Uh, I think it's a 20 late 2014. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> Alan, do you have any more questions? No, that's okay. I, I, I guess we'll kind of wrap up with uh, what it is kind of the, the heart of this. And it's a uh, question we're asking everybody and uh, all answers are okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Here, but, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, like, is there an ethics of nature photography? I mean, something that is akin to in photojournalism where a, a manipulated image is has crossed the line. It's no longer valid, and it really has become something that we can no longer consider. Uh, do you feel that in in nature photography such a thing exists? I think photojournalism and nature photography are two different types of of practices. Um, photojournalism. I mean, it, when, when I'm looking at the news, I want to know the photograph I'm looking at is real. When I'm looking at somebody's photograph of a mountain um, and they present it in a way that is artistic. I, I understand that there are, you know, artistic privileges taken with that image. Um, I don't think it's wrong to manipulate a photo as long as you're not concealing, you know, what you, what you've done. Um, but it, I don't think we need this, this whole full disclosure thing all the time. You know, when, when I'm making an image, I'm making it for me. I'm not making it for anybody else. If somebody else appreciates what I do and they like my images, that's great. Um, but I got into photography to make me happy. And it was, it was an escape mechanism at a hard time in my life. And so I create the images I want to create. And I, I do that the way that, I feel is best suited to me. Now, if, if somebody asks what goes into an image, I 100% of the time tell them what's been done. Um, I don't try to pull the wool over anybody's eyes and say that this is, you know, exactly as is, or even that whole cop out that a lot of photographers give of, you know, trying to make it look more like what the eye sees. I mean, that's all very subjective. That's a little bit of a cop out. Um, you know, just, I think it would be best if we all just own what we do and say, Hey, yeah, I mean that light was significantly enhanced. 
you That's have fine. me sold. You you don't have to apologize any further. We, yes, we, we accept you. it. We forgive you. We do love you. <laughs> Just be. <laughs> so, um, and and any projects coming out? Something you want to plug? Any any uh, workshops or books or um, anything? Yeah, I've got a few workshops coming up. Uh, Namibia in May. Uh-huh. Um, another workshop I'm leading with a, with some buddies of mine to photograph the lava in mm-hmm. February. And that's, uh, there's only a couple spots left on that. Um, Where do you go to photograph the lava? The uh, Big Island of Hawaii. Right now, um, there's a um, eruption event uh, <laughs> called the 61G um, event, which is, you know, the 61st phase of this eruption of the, the volcano out there. And so right now, the lava is flowing into the ocean, which it, you know, is, is actually a very rare thing. You might see some shots of it, you know, quite a bit online, but it's fairly rare. And, and we just happen to be lucky in our lifetime to to live during a time where where it actually happens. Um, and so it, it, it'll probably stop, you know, sometime this next year. So we're we're getting people out there to photograph this. Yeah, that's wonderful, incredible <laughs> thing. Is there um, is that only sure. worth photographing in, at nighttime, or do you, is there a lot going on in daytime as well? Uh, yeah, you don't do much during the day. It, it gets so bright that the you know the feeling of the glowing hot lava right. loses you know some of its power. Yeah. Um, so normally, I mean, we hike in at one in the morning and we're out there till about you know eight in the morning. You know, so from from middle of the night to you know a little a little while after sunrise is, right. is what we shoot it. Um, so I've got that going on. Um, you can find all of the info at ryandyer.com. So you, you said that you got into photography to make yourself happy. It sounds like you're happy. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, is, I, I'm happy. Yeah, okay. I mean, I've, I've, I've got nothing to complain too much about. So. That's great to hear. All right. I tell you, there's, it, there's a lot of Ryan's work on his website, and it's ryandyer.com, R-Y-A-N-D-Y-A-R.com. And definitely... Take some time and go through it. Uh, Ryan, great speaking with you. Love your work and uh, your answers to our questions and inquiries are dead on. Good stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me and and giving a dang about what I have to say. (laughs) (laughs) Great, man. Thanks. Well, that's a wrap for another fine show. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy our show, please share your thoughts and or comments by tweeting us with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast, or drop us an email at podcast at bhphoto.com. On behalf of John Harris, Jason Tables, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today. <laughs>